Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. As the state fends off a second wave of the coronavirus, government leaders are looking for ways to better protect workers so they can safely stay on the job. Today at a virtual event, Governor Murphy issued new COVID-19 workplace standards no matter the employer. Rhonda Schaffler will have full details later in the show, but the mandate provides across-the-board guidelines for procedures at both public and private companies. Murphy criticized the federal government for failing to put out uniform requirements and said workers will have a new online portal via the Department of Labor to file complaints. Many who are still on the front lines fear a repeat from this spring as the caseload continues to edge upward. Just shy of 1,700 new positive tests are being reported today. That's more than 10,000 new cases in the last week alone. Our cumulative total is nearly 233,000 with 14 additional deaths and more than 16,300 total fatalities. For the first time since July, hospitalized COVID-19 patients peaked above 1,000. Those numbers have prompted a ripple effect across several of New Jersey's most densely populated cities, first Newark, now Hoboken, even Patterson, issuing curfews for non-essential businesses, with other cities just waiting in the wings. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has the story. When you see this, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you this. Councilman Louis Velez showed reporters video of a packed nightclub in Patterson. 200, 300 people inside a place. You know how many cases of COVID-19 could come out of there? Hundreds. I just need one person in inside one of these places to have COVID-19. Police also took photos of several crowded clubs, bars, and restaurants this past weekend, alarmed at scenes of people partying even as Patterson's daily COVID caseload doubled in just one week to more than 45. Inside, packed, people sharing hookah pipes and passing them around. I mean, it, there was no social distancing. There were no masks. There was over 200 people. This is creating a major public safety issue. And this is a matter of life and death. We're doing everything against what we've been preaching since the pandemic ensued. So today I'm issuing an executive order. And this pertains to those bars, the nightclubs, the restaurants. Effective tomorrow, Thursday, October 29th, must close by midnight. Patterson's new COVID-driven midnight entertainment curfew matches Hoboken's, where nightlife will also shut down at midnight starting tomorrow until further notice. Both Elizabeth and East Orange are considering similar measures. Newark cracked down even harder with its 11% COVID positivity rate, now more than double the state's. The mayor ordered bars and restaurants here to stop doing indoor service at 8 p.m. It's unsustainable. I mean, it's just money pouring out. Owner Manny Robello runs his family's bar Bellows in Newark's Ironbound section where the positivity rates hit a daunting 25%. He closed at 8 last night. Dinner crowds come in from 6 to 9. So to tell everyone to leave by 8, you're basically cutting that by in half, uh, which makes a difficult situation nearly impossible. I know a lot of you store owners and other places are upset about these restrictions. But these are absolutely necessary. Newark Mayor Raz Baraka says he's giving the 8 o'clock cutoff two weeks to work until November 10th. I'm very serious. After November the 10th, if we don't see any movement, we are going to close stuff down in this town. We are going to have a very specific and targeted shutdown of specific neighborhoods. 
We have to do that. We have to do it that way. Cities can't legislate harsher orders than the states, but Baraka said he'd encourage Governor Murphy to let him reverse phase two opening regulations and impose a targeted lockdown. The governor didn't promise that today. But if at the edges a community, and particularly a large one, uh, Newark is our largest city, uh, the mayor is as good as it gets. Our side of the bargain is to plus up. So the scalpel approach from our side would be surging testing capacity, tracing capacity, uh, working with the community and faith leaders. Not every city is taking such drastic measures. Mayor Steve Fulop tweeted, extensive contact tracing efforts for Jersey City show our current uptick isn't related to businesses, but more so to family friends hosting in-home gatherings. But towns like Patterson, desperate to dodge a second COVID wave, are acting now. This is about public safety and keeping people safe. So we're going to go out there and make sure that we do that in every aspect. Patterson officials say they'll use tools like fire inspections and alcohol laws on top of the executive order to crack down on those who ignore public safety. In Patterson, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Hospitals are starting to feel the strain again with a new wave of virus patients. Newark's restrictions on non-essential businesses are being backed by the head of the city's university hospital. Dr. Sharif El Nahal is predicting the situation will get worse if the state doesn't get this surge under control, pointing to the rising number of new COVID-19 patient admissions at his facility, where the number of hospitalizations is doubling every week. Dr. El Nahal joins me now. Dr. Alnahal, really good to see you. Thank you for taking a few minutes with us. You know, we're seeing now consecutive days of statewide hospitalizations um, above the 900 mark. Not long ago, your hospital was reporting zero COVID-19 patients. When did that start to change? Well, Brianna, it really started to change just a few weeks ago. We had uh, zero just about a month ago. And a couple of weeks ago, we started to see a trickle of new hospitalizations for COVID-19. Uh, the real concerning thing is that compared to last week, we've actually doubled the number of patients, still an absolute low number, uh, only 20 now, 10 last week. Uh, but if that trend continues, Brianna, we could see a significant rise in cases in our hospital. At our worst, we had about 300 patients uh, in the hospital at any one time admitting uh, 10, 15, 20 a day, discharging 10 a day, uh, continuous churn of very sick patients with the disease. Uh, we're not seeing that yet, but it is cause for alarm. Uh, and I think that's why you're starting to see some of the mayors and local jurisdictions taking action. Yeah. Is that something that you support, uh, particularly in your city there? Well, not having my state purview anymore, I will say uh, that it does have a um, a strong signaling effect in telling people that they have to take the restriction seriously, at the very least, uh, which I think is beneficial. Uh, the fact that Mayor Baraka, for example, uh, took the time at a press conference to sound the alarm, has been on social media, has been on his Facebook town halls, uh, sounding the alarm on the number of new cases uh, is important. And the fact is, certain parts of York uh, are not only above 10% positivity, but even 20% uh, in the Ironbound and some other places. And that's really concerning. Those are the types of positivity rates that preceded uh, the surge of hospitalizations we saw in the spring. And so uh, I don't blame local leaders at all for trying to take action, at the very least, to signal to everyone uh, to not gather indoors, to socially distance, uh, and to wear masks at all times. Yeah, I wonder what's different for you now, having had the vantage point of being a state health commissioner, um, you have said publicly that, that we are in a second wave. Is there anything different this go around? And are you seeing anything different with the cases that are presenting in the hospital? So um, it is definitely a cause for concern. Uh, that said, uh, we do seem to be seeing a virus that uh, is a little bit less severe in terms of uh, the need to admit patients to the hospital and deaths. Uh, we did have one death from COVID-19 last week, um, and we have seen a, a trickle up of hospitalizations, but compared to uh, the ratio, I should say, of those things to total cases, that ratio seems to be lower so far, and that's also a national trend. Uh, so that, I think, is due to a combination of things. We're better at treating the disease. We understand it better. Uh, more people are taking precautions so that uh, new cases don't necessarily mean three or four additional cases. Um, and I do think also... Uh, that there could be some biological reason that's still being studied. 
Uh, but all that said, those are encouraging signs, but uh, we still need to limit the number of new cases. Dr. Sharif Alnahal, always good to catch up with you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Meantime, more fallout for the state-run veterans' homes. The U.S. Department of Justice is launching a federal civil rights investigation into the high death count at both the Paramus and Menlo Park veterans' homes. That's according to a letter sent by the department Tuesday to Governor Murphy's office. It cites concerns that the quality of medical care at the facilities has been, quote, deficient. State officials say 190 residents and two caregivers died from the coronavirus during the pandemic. That's one-third of residents residents in both homes. A spokesperson for Governor Murphy says the investigation is politically motivated, being announced a week before Election Day. And we are just six days out from the general election, though experts predict the almost entirely vote-by-mail process means it'll extend well beyond November 3rd. According to the state, we're already seeing record turnout, more than 2.5 million ballots cast, and more Democrats driving the early vote. So what's on the minds of voters as they head to the ballot box rather than the polls this year? We sent correspondent Michael Hill to find out. Official election ballot drop box. Right. There will be no confusion about post offices or things getting lost. That's how Chris Lewis summed up mail-in voting seconds after he put his ballot in this box in a year when reorganization at the United States Postal Service raised doubts that ballots would be delivered on time to be counted. It's not that I don't trust the post office. It's right. just that in a year like this, You do what say. This is one of 20 drop boxes in Bergen County, where Hillary Clinton outperformed Donald Trump by 55,000 votes in 2016, and where some mail-in voters point fingers about the undermining of the mail system. I believe there is meddling in the mail system because Trump had put his guy in there and he's all that story about him and everything, so... It sounds like he's playing games with our election. Here in Sussex County during the evening rush hour, there was a steady stream of voters dropping off their mail-in ballots at this drop box at the Sparta police station. Four years ago, Trump bested Clinton by 22,000 votes in Sussex County, where we found mail-in voting views that match those of Bergen County voters. This is the safest way I know, Indeed. rather than come in person on election day, which I'm not going to do. I also spoke with my uh, senator about it just to make sure like what was the most fail-proof or foolproof method and this this turns out to be the... It's very informal. You don't feel like it's real. You'd have been okay mailing it? I think so, but I just waited too long so I wanted to just get it into the box. Would you put cash in the mail and trust that you will get it? If you can't answer that question, and I can't go vote in person, this is the only best option I have. James Cable objects to New Jersey's mostly mail-in ballot election. I don't think we're under such a big threat that we couldn't manage in-person voting safely. So why did he put his ballot here instead of mailing it? Obviously, there have been issues uh, made public about uh, mishandling, possible mishandling in the mail, so this was just just a little more assurance. Voters had concerns about their signatures matching, and one suggested comparing ballot signatures with ones on driver's licenses to make contacting voters unnecessary and to shorten the cure process. That's among the issues raising voter insecurity in the era of COVID-19. I don't feel confident at all. As a matter of fact, I'm not a nervous person. I've had a lot of anxiety about what's going to happen to this country in the next couple of years. I really do. I really don't feel like either candidate has our best interest at heart. I feel like the, the, the country's just going downhill. In Sparta, Michael Hill, NJ Spotlight News. As the countdown to the election continues, New Jersey's Senate candidates, Democrat Cory Booker and Republican Rick Mehta, join senior correspondent David Cruz Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. for Chatbox, live on our YouTube channel. Send your questions for the candidates ahead of time to chatbox at njspotlightnews.org or just ask them live. 
Among the stack of bills that made it to Governor Murphy's desk this fall is a ban on plastic and paper shopping bags. Environmentalists are still waiting for him to sign it, but they're not sitting idly by while they do. There's a new proposal kicking around Trenton, modeled after legislation from the West Coast, looking to reduce plastic pollution even further. Our energy and environment reporter Tom Johnson is here to explain. Tom, what's at the heart of this proposal and how and why does it reflect what's being done in California? Well, uh, the state and legislators, environmentalists and others have really wanted to, to eliminate and or reduce how much plastics are going into the environment. And one of the best ways they think they can do that is by uh, increasing the recycled content and what plastics are now manufactured. And this bill would eventually increase the content from uh, up to 50% must be recycled plastic and plastic beverage containers and other uh, products. The whole idea is if you reduce using virgin materials, you'll reduce not only the waste stream, but the use of fossil fuels. Does this have support? I mean, we've been watching this plastic bag uh, ban bill kick around here. Does this have support in the legislature? Well, so far, it doesn't seem to have as much opposition as the plastic bill um, uh, generated. Uh, the plastic industry, they want to use more um, plastic recycled content in their products to reduce the opposition that has generated plastic bans and uh, prohibitation on uh, single use plastic bags and single use paper bags. Tom, very quickly, how much of a difference would this make? 15 seconds. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. It'll make a significant difference if they go to 50% uh, plastic recycled content, but it's not going to solve the plastic problem completely. Yeah, we need a whole lot for that, right? Tom Johnson, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. For more on how the state is trying to spur the use of recycled plastic, check out Tom Johnson's story on njspotlightnews.org. An executive order to safeguard workers from the coronavirus, but what does it include? Rhonda Schaffler has details and today's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, Governor Murphy today issued a new executive order he says is designed to protect New Jersey workers. The order establishes workplace health and safety standards to cover all public and private sector workers in the state. As more sectors of our economy have opened, and as the federal government remains inactive on the sidelines, we will ensure that every worker stands under the same umbrella of protections. Among other things, all workers would have to undergo a health screening before each shift, maintain at least six feet of distance from each other, wear a mask in most cases, and get periodic breaks to wash their hands. Workers also must be told if there is a known exposure to coronavirus in the workplace. Businesses that don't comply face a potential shutdown by the state. The New Jersey Business and Industry Association criticized the new order, saying most businesses already have safeguards in place and that there is no need for more mandates or additional costs for businesses. New Jersey's housing market is showing no signs of slowing down. New Jersey Realtors President Angela Sicoli says homes are moving fast. The bar demand, Rhonda, is incredible. Uh, we're seeing um, the stockpile diminish because of so many buyers in comparison to sellers and the prices just continue going up. The median sales price for all New Jersey properties was $375,000 in September. That's 21% higher than last September. Pending sales last month surged nearly 50%. NJ Realtors expects buyer demand will remain strong through the fall.
New Jersey Representative Josh Gottheimer today urged congressional leaders to reach an agreement on a new COVID-19 relief deal. He says another round of PPP loans are needed to help businesses in New Jersey and elsewhere. Wall Street on edge again today. Here's a look at the selling. I'm Rhonda Schapler and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by ELEC and Operating Engineers 825, repairing our critical infrastructure and building our recovery. Learn more at elec825.org. And by Junior Achievement of New Jersey, celebrating 100 years as a mission and announcing this year's virtual NJ Business Hall of Fame on November 19th at 6 p.m. Event details online at janj.org. Starting next week, it'll cost you more than just dirty looks if you don't wear a mask on a Port Authority train bus or at the airport. The agency announced this week it'll impose a $50 fine for anyone going maskless. That includes PATH trains and all transportation terminals. The Bi-State Agency is following the lead of New York's MTA, which started issuing fines in mid-September. Port Authority officials say the change isn't because riders aren't complying, but as a safety precaution with resurgence of the virus and authorities admittedly unable to enforce a travel ban between border states. And it looks more and more unlikely New Jersey will mirror some of those neighboring states by easing indoor restrictions anytime soon. That's an especially tough blow for restaurant owners. Many are just now beginning to get on their feet with a few months worth of outdoor dining revenue behind them. They've been buoyed by heat lamps and a mild fall. But how will they survive once the cold weather rolls in? Leah Mishkin reports. This is the third time I've shut down three times in one year. And it's just, it's just crazy. First, it was a lockdown. Then a pipe burst in her ceiling. Then an employee tested positive for COVID. I mean, we've all tested negative, so thank God for that. Our employees on the men. Restaurant owner Cynthia Pasillo says she recently shut down for two weeks out of safety to have her entire team quarantine. Her new challenge? Winter. Try getting them. They're really in like not easy to find right now because everybody's doing the same thing. Pasilla was able to stay afloat with her outdoor tents, but with snow on the horizon, she's not sure how her two heater setup will hold up. I don't see any aid coming. So I just do what I do and I'll get up every morning and keep hoping that it's going to change and get better. That's it. What am I going to do? Many restaurants won't be able to hold on much longer with the change in seasons if indoor dining stays at 25 percent, says the president and CEO of New Jersey Restaurant and Hospitality Association, Mary Lou Halverson. So there's just over 25,000 restaurants uh, in the state of New Jersey. You know, right now we're probably at about 40 percent independent restaurants closing. I mean, this continues without having the ability to do outdoor dining. I mean, it's just going it, to, it'll cripple the industry. And something should be noted is we contribute $18 billion to the state's economy and taxes. Senator Declan O'Scanlan is pushing to get indoor dining to 66%. That would get a lot of restaurants uh, over the line where they can operate at a profit. How did you get to that number, 66%? It's a compromise. I mean, we've spent huge amounts of time researching what other states have done, comparing uh, rate of spread, uh, in other states. Some restaurants can't get to 50% just because of the six feet requirement. Allowing the plexiglass, you know, as permanent um, barriers in between booths and tables would be helpful. Governor Murphy addressed indoor dining on News 12 last week on Ask Governor Murphy and said while he can't tie the increase in new cases to indoor dining, increasing capacity at a time when numbers are spiking would send mixed messages. I'd love to get there. Believe me, I would love to get there. Now, when I talk about federal help, uh, I think uh, high on that list are rest restaurants and hospitality who have been crushed by this. But we're pleading with people that the numbers have gone against us. We're one of the only two states at 25%, and none of the spikes keep, are coming from restaurants. I just think that they should leave it to the people to make their choices and their decisions, you know? Cynthia Pasillo says she has fewer people working, 
more stress and something has to give because the industry is getting hit and she refuses to close her doors. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. Next Tuesday, November 3rd, our NJ Spotlight News team will bring you live election coverage starting at 9 p.m. from the campus of Montclair State University. Michael Hill and I will co-anchor with help from our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, and editor-at-large, Colleen O'Day. Our reporters and political analysts will be fanned out across the state, both in person and virtually, bringing you insight on the races and ballot questions in play. Don't miss it live on NJTV and streaming across all of our digital platforms. And that does it for us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie. How are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever. I'm Kayla, and this is what I work for. To teach him. To protect her and to take care of me, too. I need health insurance that does the same, that makes things easier for my schedule. So I can focus on what matters. This is my life, and this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me, and him, and her.